the Kimberley, that's our shared canvas. That's the canvas that we can all relate to. It's a humbling canvas because we feel so small and so insignificant in it. these tiny cameras to see what life does when there's no humans there and I'll just sit them, let them run and then uh, go away for a while and, and come back, see what I get and what happens is it just comes to life a few minutes after humans go. You can see in fact when I walk into shot it all disappears before I get there. What I really like about these crabs, I think, is their, their eyes. It seems their eyes are their main ad adaptation for survival. get a shot of this because he's such a beautiful crab. Oops. I don't know whether he's going to come back this fella. I'm going to wait for a while. Come on fella. Beautiful fella. Peter's natural curiosity for these creatures has led him to an unusual assignment, to raise the profile of one of the planet's unknown scientific territories, the Kimberley in Western Australia. He would travel aboard the Olivia J in an expedition with a group of scientists from the Western Australian Marine Science Institution. His challenge as a photographer is to find a world that is unnoticed by science and not seen by the wider community. To bring home images that would raise new interest and a new audience for conservation and science. It's almost a self-imposed mission because there's currently no baseline support or funding for a regional marine science program in the Kimberley Browse Marine Region. So what we're doing is teaming up with Peter Strain and um, the, the team on Olivia J just to try and get our team ashore, just to have a look at these reefs. I'm not sure what it is about the Kimberley. It, it's the absolute adventure, the challenge of going to a place where it's uncharted, so every time we go to a new place, it's a, a challenge for us. You can cruise through the Kimberleys here, and you are literally surrounded by islands. There's two and a half thousand of them. And some of the rivers uh, to go up, they're, they're inland seas. The, the bay that feeds the river is 30 to 40 mile inland. And the way to get there is through huge whirlpools and the only way to get there in a boat like ours is either by dinghy or um, wait for a neap tide until there's no tide, which makes everything another adventure. And this would have to be the purest place in Australia.
The Kimberley is a mysterious place, known only to the traditional owners and hidden from the outside world. Here survives some of the oldest rock art in the world, documenting life possibly up to 50,000 years old. The traditional owners observed their country over thousands of years and have developed an understanding of how to survive here by utilising the giant tides for food and transport. The early scientific explorers often engaged their help. G'day Peter. Where are we going? Well, as we've discussed... The scientists want to examine two unique sites. The first being an unusual phenomena of coral reefs living in the most extreme conditions in Talbot Bay. On the way, they want to spend some time at Camden Sound, one of the largest known humpback whale nurseries in the Southern Hemisphere. To get there, they need the experience of Captain John Marr and Chris Powick. They have years of experience as tourist operators and fishermen here and have a special connection with the place. In this area, it's really important to have all the details, particularly on tides. They're, they're, the, they're a major factor in everything we do, is tides, because there's down here, there's 12 metres tide in some of these areas, 14 in a couple of others, and even big boats like this, and the best of the big boats run aground sometimes because the charts are very poor for the area, or almost totally uncharted. And it's, it's a gamble, it's an adventure to come here. And believe me, there are plenty of rocks that we haven't found yet. Uh, <laughs> you know? I'm in 7-7 seven, seven right now. 7 foot. 6 and a half. OK, go then. See what's in there. Corner in front of you, there's a rock sticking out, if you see it, let me know. The reef comes out from where it's charted by that much, right? which is a significant amount. It's, 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 it's enough to destroy a boat. That's just such a dangerous spot. There we are, we missed all the rocks now. Aren't you happy? Oh, yeah, glad you know where you're going, John. All right, there. Today, scientists are approaching Camden Sound. Their mission is to count and record the behaviour of the humpback whales, especially the mother and calves. Camden Sound is a unique site for humpback whales, affectionately called megafauna by the scientists. To help track them, a hydrophone is used to record their song. Chris sits the boat still and they wait for the whales to approach. Suddenly, a blow in the distance, a mother and her calf. The reasons why they come here are still unknown, but scientists suspect the warm temperatures combined with thousands of sheltered inlets makes it an ideal place to raise young. Oh. Oh. 
Oh, you're good, yeah. oh. So, uh, yeah, some really great behaviours. Calves um, going on the backs, rolling around, coming on the side. The mother's basically pushing the calf into the current and the calf just hanging uh, upside down, sideways on, like this. It was absolutely incredible. So definitely the mothers are training the calves in these inshore waters around these tidal streams. And, uh, and of course they can then also tuck out of the main current streams uh, and give the calf a rest. Yeah, oh, beautiful. I'd like people to pay more attention to the other animals. I mean, there are, for me, there is far more fascination in the macro world than the, than the, than the megafauna. He does absolutely the best at what he does. I've never seen anything like it. And I've never seen some of the things that he photographs because he's so patient. It is quite remarkable that almost all the life on the reefs that I know of are small. Right? All miniatures, stunted, little baby stuff. You know, these are the little beasties that, that, that live here. It's brilliant. Yeah, oh, I get quite carried away with what he does. So I, you know, I put this boat on the line. This is what I've done, some of the stuff I've done so far. So this is my style of photo photography. Wow, wow. character. <laughs> okay, that's Mr. Roy, he's named after a Chinaman up in Singapore. But it's anthropomorphic, you know, it's, it's art. This is in fact a fantasy character. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not all fantasy characters, but uh, a lot of them are. And, and, and it may not work with your scientific needs, I suppose, but... Uh, Wow, fantastic. Look at the detail in that. Yeah, so I'm going for art values a lot of the time. It's, it's, it's what I do. I, I, I think it's worthwhile for what you guys do in the sense that it can draw attention to uh, nature, if you like. Whether it helps with science, I don't know. When I pick up a snail like that, I know who he is and give him a Latin name. Um, but I, I don't see the detail that you've got here, and the, and the reason why I find that stimulating, I suppose it is the anthropomorphic aspect of it. It appeals to me because it's cute, I suppose. And in some cases, some of the moths you had are, are not just cute, they're beautiful. And that's a stimulating thing. So it's not just a matter of the, of the information content it has, it, it also uh, you know, stimulates your aesthetic response to it. So it's, well, always been taught that anthropomorphism gets in the way of good science and so well and he taught you that it's, I mean, it's a very natural human thing to do and anthropomorphism is what people do don't they I mean by definition even scientists do it so where are we going this time John Maybe. Turtle Reef going very well we couldn't have picked it better actually left two hours before the tide and we're going to get the run in. We could not do better. Just fabulous. that island yeah. called Turtle Reef. It goes almost right across to the other island over there. Yeah. Works its way for two and a half mile in that general direction. And we came to this place because uh, it was drawn to our attention a couple of photographs that were taken by a visitor up here 
in 1917, uh, which indicated that the reef edge, at least, of some of these areas uh, are intensely rich, extremely rich in coral species. Yeah. Rather recently, we started to look at the aerial photographs and the uh, Landsat images and Google Earth and realised that, uh, which I'm sure the local people had known for many years, but we realised that uh, there are vast expanses of coral platform reefs here inside this landlocked situation in Talbot Bay, which was uh, a big surprise. Most coral reefs thrive in clear oceanic waters, like the Great Barrier Reef. Here in Talbot Bay, it appears they are surviving in the most unlikely conditions. Highly stressed conditions for coral growth, such as high temperatures and turbid waters. Compared to other reefs around the world, the existence of this reef is a mystery. In fact, prior to 1923, it was widely published that there were no reefs in Western Australia. There's a terrible name, this guy. He's called Sido Vitagus or Luco. <laughs> I'll call him Eric. Call him Eric. Okay. Beautiful. You've got a, a shell, an empty shell of a, of a sea urchin. It's dead, and all the, the live body is now dissolved away. When they're alive, they crawl around in the sand, buried in the sand, and uh, they're feeding on, on detrital stuff. In the, uh, in the sediment, and in life they're covered with, with sharp, long, sharp spines, and when you see a, see a lump that you dig up to see what it is, you get your fingers prickled, and you can see the, 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 um, the pattern look like a starfish. In fact, they're quite, it's a class of animals, um, the sea urchins, that are closely related to the starfishes. Because I work visually, when I look at that clam, and it's the same for some of the polyps, uh, and when I photograph right in that orifice area there, it looks to me like it's a visual attractant that it might attract prey in there. Well, I mean, that's, that's feasible. But what you're overlooking is that there are other senses that organisms have, and visual is only one of them. Tactile is, is in an animal like this, tactile is even more important. And, and, and uh, the chemoreceptors in a lot of, a lot of invertebrates, a lot of animals, is more, much more important than visual. OK, but that could be because you guys have no explanation for the visual. It could be, or can we say we have a much better explanation for the, for the tactile? But and then when you're facing... Do you have any explanation for the visual, for the patterning and the, and the colour? I don't have any, but, but you, the, the whole point about any of this stuff is that there are so many mysteries that you can't account for ah, in natural history. So science has mysteries as well. Of course. Yeah, great. Well, the aesthetics is where, where the scientist really usually begins, because he, he's concerned by the mystery of it. He yeah. wants to know how this works. What is the thing of this colour? What are these tracks so for? So you guys are led in by human led values. Led in by it. Led in by human values. And they're all, they're all about the, the desire to understand how, how this animal works in its ecosystem. And then more than that, how does the ecosystem work? And then more than that, how does the universe work? And you're led into it by, you know, as a kid usually, by looking at stuff like this and saying, oh, what's that all about? Like, you came here three years ago, so what's the difference? Well, there's a lot of dead coral here now. Three years ago along this edge here, there used to be a lot of staghorn, a lot of soft coral, a lot of anemones. There was a big school of clownfish down, just down past these rocks here, they're not here. So it's pretty much whether it's just a bit of coral bleaching or, you know, you can even see all the clamshells are dying off here. The whole lot's just slowly dying away. So whether it's just the heat, you know, in, in the summertime here, when the water temperature's so small, you know, the water's so shallow. Yeah, who knows? Love to know. Love to know. There's your turtle, mate. <laughs> the team have only a short window to work on the exposed reef. Here in the Kimberley are giant tides, up to 14 metres high, twice a day. A dynamic, ever-changing environment. Ah. 
large numbers of turtles approach the reef to seek refuge and feed. Go! Here we go, this guy. Go. There's three of them there, four. Shallow. They're all waiting to get up on the river. Yeah, they're all waiting. There's hundreds of them up there in the corner. The team takes the opportunity to explore the other side of Turtle Reef. Okay, well, we're on the northern side of Turtle Reef now, and we're just having a quick sticky because it's a bit of a labyrinth of reefs and rocks in here. Uh, most of these so-called rocks on the chart are in fact coral reefs, which is remarkable. Um, what we've got here is a, a low platform exposed on one of these big low tides, and to say it would be 100% hard coral cover and algal cover here. So we're quite excited at the moment to see um, what is you know, an absolutely luxuriant coral reef. We're surrounded by turtles and fish. Um, this is exposed that in about an hour's time this will be covered in water. Um, but as I said, our prediction that this area is well washed, just looking at that is just remarkable, absolutely remarkable. The coral platform has grown up and it's incredibly rich and still, still growing. And then you get the, the, slot, the ramp when there's bugger all, and then you get down the platform underneath and you start all over again. But I, I'd have to say, I think this reef is richer than anything I've seen in the Merits or anywhere else. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. Maybe. It's, 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 uh, <clears throat> I mean, it's, we're not talking about a little, pity little coral reef here. This is a, a major event. Yeah of a kind, you know, we're not utterly unreported. It's, it's quite different to the other side here. But look at all this acropora through here, which is, you can see it dead on the top of yep, the line yep. in the fringes. Yep. But how in the hell do we represent it? That Let's hike over here first of all and sort of see what the dimensions of what we've got to do here. You can even see on the area it look different on this side, it was darker. So these coral reefs are actually growing in geological time and it takes several thousand years to build a reef like this. Um, and one of the surprises is this reef, of course, um, cannot be older as a, as a living system than 6,000 years because before that the sea level was much lower. So in 6,000 years you've got to imagine this vast area of, of um, carbonate platform uh, has been constructed and that's 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 a bit of a surprise. These are so big that it's hard to imagine they could have grown in such a short time. And we, we float over it now in our vessels and uh, we don't often think that people lived down there not so very long ago. But if you then imagine, what, what would have been the cultural impact of a rise of sea level, sea level of that magnitude? In all that country, hundreds of square miles of it, thousands of square miles of it becomes flooded by the sea. People have to retreat back from where they were, back onto the, onto the higher land of the Kimberley, where they are now. And places like Montgomery Reef, which was in fact once a flat top Kimberley, flat top mountain, now becomes a, a flat reef at sea level. Now, once that happened, the people uh, became, they adapted their lifestyle, which presumably would have been terrestrial. But once there, they turned it into a marine culture instead. And that's, that did them well for 6,000 years. So these, these sorts of uh, episodes of drastic change of climate and sea level uh, are something that we're now worrying about ourselves. But they have happened before, and they've had profound effects on people's culture and on their livelihoods. It is in this understanding of flooding 6,000 years ago that Western science and indigenous knowledge meet. The indigenous people 
have passed down flooding stories from generation to generation, and this is now understood by science. The discovery of these young growing reefs challenges the theory of where reefs grow. These reefs are flourishing in the most unlikely conditions. Turbid waters, extreme tides, high temperatures and long exposure to the sun. Which way is the reef? I'll check. The excitement of discovering these healthy and unique reefs has motivated Steve to call in the big guns in photographic images. An aerial survey with a state-of-the-art hyperspectral sensor. So what we do is we fly a plane that flies over the target, which in our case is going to be Turtle Reef and the few reefs around. The hyperspectral sensor and other image sensors on board the aircraft allow us to see a 3D impression of coral reef habitats in ways not possible until today. In the largely unsurveyed regions of the Kimberley, this groundbreaking image will give us a new perspective and at a regional scale. It will be the first survey of its kind over Turtle Reef and will present an accurate map of the reef communities. To do this, however, scientists need to map the reef habitats in the field exactly at the same time as the aerial images are taken. Clear weather and well-planned transacts are needed from the team on the ground. In Broome, aircraft pilot Jörg Hacker is on standby. To best expose life in this unseen world, detailed macro photography is critical. This is where photographic artist Peter Strain's skills come together with the science team to help present a compelling record up of the Turtle Reef. The ramp is and up on top. And we've got to characterise what the corals are here because it's quite a different coral assemblage to what's up on top. And what do you want me to do? What I'd like you to do um, is uh, to work out as best you can how many different kinds of corals there are here and give us a, a shot of the whole colony and then come in on a shot macro of the, of the, of the coral polyps so we can hopefully we'll, we'll be able to identify it. Why do we want to do this with an aeroplane? There's enough satellites up there that can see the Earth and measure it all. That's what people think. But with aircraft you can do a lot of other things. You get much higher resolution. You can go to a place and measure things at the time that you want, not when the satellite decides to be there. So airborne remote sensing is really a very important um, part of the puzzle to solve the mysteries of the Earth. Sorry, uh, hang on. One of the most amazing things about the Kimberley fringing reefs and islands environment is this juxtaposition of mangroves, corals, marine plants and algae, seagrass, all living very, very closely together. So it really is quite unlike anything else I've seen elsewhere in Australia and um, one would hope it's deserve of some good independent baseline scientific information. The baseline information will actually tell us about the health status of the mangroves, the reefs and the like and without that information it's very very hard for us to make any comments about change whether it's man-made natural change such as cyclones or storm surges. Probably Peter's photography can help us a little bit with that in just helping raise the profile of this Kimberley coastal region and the magnificence and the beauty of all of the little beasties that live in amongst the reefs and the mangroves and also those reef flat tops. Artists, scientists and indigenous people have had a long tradition of discovering the natural world here in the Kimberley. And one of my heroes is Philip Parker King. Now that man uh, made a, a, a huge con a contribution. He mapped the whole of the coast, 
He drew attention of the world, Charles Darwin included, that there were coral reefs on the Kimberley coast, which nobody wanted to believe. You know, and he did his art himself. Now he was not just an artist, not just a scientist, he was everything. And I guess one of my beefs is that these days we're all so specialised and we don't want to talk to each other, it's too hard. Um, but, but that is one of the great challenges, it seems to me, to try and get back that sense of scholarship and the breadth of the world and see it in emotional terms, artistic terms and scientific terms. It's all one as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> There's a strong argument amongst geologists mostly that we could rename this era that we're in now the Anthropocene, which is the era when human beings have, effect, have been the major effect on the planet. Um, and, and there's two ways of looking at that. There's catastrophic, you know, that we're all doomed, or there's accepting responsibility for the fact that we are influencing it and uh, trying to make uh, our influence on nature, either benign or, or better, to improve it. I, I guess um, we have to change our behaviour to work with nature. That's the Anthropocene. That's the Anthropocene challenge. The Kimberley Think that Aboriginal people have lived here for 60 odd thousand years. It's incredible. This place is one of the most special places on planet Earth without any shadow of doubt.